Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. And uh, as soon as the plane goes overhead, uh, I will start us all with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today, both through Zoom and through our spirits. Thank you for the chance to learn more about our faith and the, uh, our, the forefathers and mothers of our faith. Please help us be aware of what we say and what we think we say when we profess witness. And let us know the place of public witness has in your plan for our lives, the world, and your kingdom. Amen. Amen. So, uh, and I'll just have a little quick plug here. Uh, the, in the next couple of class, classes coming up, uh, Jeffrey will continue this class in February because of some um, scheduling whoopsie doodles that we had to do this fall. Um, next week's class, we're going to do three classes in a row in person at the Grad Center uh, with John Buchanan and Tom Dozman talking about uh, King David, um, David Colin Shepherd, warrior and monarch. And uh, so I will leave it uh, now. I'll leave it to Jeff to take it away. Thank you much, Jim. And if we can all uh, mute for um, time being. And because I need to be able to be heard, I will apologize. We live right over the Metro tracks. We're six stories up, but they're working on the tracks this weekend. So you may get plenty of Metro train horns as accompaniment, but uh, just let me know if they interfere and I'll I'll do what I can here. I'm, I was delighted to actually get back in and review the Apostles' Creed because I, I imagine like most of you, and wonderfully we did it in worship this morning and they did it without my asking. I put it in to have it for next week so we could reflect on it when we you know, stand and affirm it, whether at home or in the sanctuary. Um, but most of the time, the words come out, and the fact that they do, and they're one of the few things many of us have memorized, are its power. And we'll talk more about that later. But I find it very intriguing to be part of a church which values the confessions. And you know, the, the whole topic to me is fascinating, but, you know, we now have them stretching from the earliest one, Nicene, which would evolve between the second and the fourth centuries, and our most recent one, which is the Belhar Confession that comes out of South Africa, and it came out of the closing years of apartheid. So we have a stretch and there are 10 confessions that we honor. Today, we're gonna to focus in on the one that I would wager we all know best because for years, the Apostles' Creed at fourth has been a key component of our liturgy. Um, <clears throat> I wanna take a first section where I will do some presentation, and then I want to encourage you to use chat, which Jim is going to monitor. So if you've got questions, get them on chat, please. We'll also, when I pause after maybe eight or nine minutes, I can see some of you anyway, and between Jim and I, hopefully we'll spot you if you wave a hand. So. It's either chat or waving a hand on discussion. The first section, we're going to look at the evolution of the Apostles' Creed because it began in some early forms in the second century, but it took until the ninth century for it to be formalized. And what I'm going to try and do is suggest some of the ways it found its way through these centuries and the circumstances under which it was formalized finally in the early ninth century. 
The first of the creeds, just so if you want to keep them in order, was Nicene. And uh, it is one that we seldom read, but I was always intrigued and challenged when I helped lead worship in a neighboring Roman Catholic church that everyone else worshiping there was on their feet and rattling off Nicene in ways that my tongue found hard to get the words to keep up with those intriguing clauses all about Jesus. Um, the Apostles' Creed is probably simpler and more straightforward and after the Nicene Creed, which is the most popular in worldwide Christianity, the Apostles is the most universally accepted doctrinal statement in Christianity. And it's more prevalent in Western Christianity than in Eastern Christianity. Um, it began as a baptismal formula um, <clears throat> and they've got roots of this in the second century. Um, and it was a way in which we could put together, we, I'm saying that historically, <laughs> that the Christian community could put together the essentials of the apostolic teaching and be able to share them. Of course, at the time, the, in, in earlier centuries of Christianity, those who were seeking baptism were adult believers because that's the folks who were being baptized then. And so forms of the Apostles' Creed became the teaching that they went through in the Lenten season before joining the Christian church, usually in the Easter vigil. Um, that's uh, a key part of that. There are, in terms of the roots in the second century, there is something we now call the rule of faith, which was a compendium of the apostles teaching. And it, it was very useful for instructing new Christians. And in that explosive growth of Christianity, there was a real yearning for how are we going to hold on to what it is that we believe. And so the earliest forms that we have seen of the Apostles' Creed are a question and answer, sort of a three-part question and answer. Do you believe in God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Um, and it reminded Christians in saying it of our baptisms. I have used differing confessions in worship when I was at the preceding church I served for 27 years. So they got heavy doses of other confessions of faith. But every time there was a baptism, I made certain we were using the Apostles' Creed because of its rootage in baptism. There was a second rule early on that has made our search for more specifics about it complicated. It was a rule of secrecy. The early church was worried about misunderstanding of its faith, and so they decided better not to have any written creeds except in between the second and fourth centuries where the Nicene Creed came into being. That was an exception. Others were not written down. And it was also for fear of persecution. Um, if there was something that you knew um, and was shaping you that somehow seemed to depart from the civil authorities, Christianity had struggles with that. But it, it leaves us on a constant search. Scholars have clues. They have ideas, but it's not that we can just chart it back to this formulation and that. Um, there's also an intriguing thing called the legend of the Apostles' Creed, 
which was very popular early in the church. Uh, Augustine, an early theologian, was, was a fan of this. That, and the reason I'm saying legend is we've let go of its historicity. But the first legend, and I was looking at it again this week, was that on the first Pentecost, all the apostles got together. And each one of the 12 apostles came up with a phrase of the creed, and then it was all put together. From my understanding of the messiness of human behavior, that seemed way too neat. So, so I'm glad we don't hold on to that as a fact. <clears throat> um, but I was intrigued. Um, Micah Marty of our staff got a hold of me this week. And you may have seen in some of the promotions for the class that he found a wonderful textile at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that has a woven picture for each of the phrases of the Apostles' Creed. So, and that came out of the 15th, 16th century, but it, the power of the creed is not diminished as we let go of the legend that somehow the apostles themselves were the authors. We do have a literary strain of the creed that many people are willing to acknowledge now. Um, and my prime source on this is um, theologian Jack Rogers. He was professor at San Francisco Seminary. He was also moderator of the General Assembly in his day, but he was a great student of the creeds. So if you're looking for more, I really encourage you to go to Jack Rogers' book. Um, he identified the literary formation as a Benedictine monk, Priminius, in the late 8th century, who was serving near Provence, France, and came upon a form of the creed that was question and answer that the church in that region had been using since the 5th century. He then became a missionary to south of Germany, and he wrote a handbook for his missionary colleagues, and he included the Apostles' Creed in the question and answer form. This caught the attention of Charlemagne, Charles the Great, who entitled himself the Holy Roman Emperor. And he wanted some uniformity of creed because he saw himself as both the civil leader of the Roman Empire, but also the ecclesial leader. Um, and he wanted everyone, at least all the priests, to know the creed and not just to be able to recite it, but to understand it. So he encouraged it to be translated into French and into German. And at that time, the Roman Empire was pretty much Northern European. And this led with his advocacy and support in the opening of the ninth century for the text of the Apostles' Creed to finally emerge in a way that we can identify. I'm going to leave it there on the evolution, but <clears throat> I want to just seed some discussion. Don't worry, we're going to spend plenty of time on the language, but I wanted to do this first, setting both the process and the context. I'm curious if there are surprises or questions that this stirred up for you. I'm also interested that this evolutionary process where it grew in certain areas but wasn't unified was very particular 
and for something, for something that, that, that anyway, uh, I want you all to get in. Something that was very particular is now universal. I like that paradox. I, Louise had her hand up first. Yes, Louise. This is, since I will say this now because we're talking about Jack Rogers. He preached at Fourth Church one time, many years ago. He was in a wheelchair and I can still remember watching the house staff lift him from the floor of the sanctuary to the chancel so that he could speak with a microphone from his wheelchair. Mm, great memory, Louise. I was grateful to meet Jack on a, just a couple of occasions as a leader of the church. And once I started reading his material, I became even more interested. Other comments or questions? Well, it's, inter it's interesting that they, they wanted to codify it so they could be better evangelicals. Yeah. I think whatever the varieties of his motivation, he had a sense that this would advance the faith much more readily. So I see Charlotte's hand. I was just going to say that I could see why the story about each apostle writing a line or two took hold. It's a wonderful story. I like it myself, <laughs> whether it's debunked or not. I like yeah. the call and response notion, you know, question, answer. That's a cool thought. Well, and we've, we've got forms of that in the current time and an intriguing variation in worship would be to have, um, it's usually one of the pastors who's leading do the question and then we could all respond um, because it appears that was, that form was the earliest in its roots. So I like both, I like that idea. And I'm with you, Charlotte, great legend, true or not, so. <clears throat> Roger posted a question. Uh, many statements of faith follow the pattern of the Apostles' Creed. Why would that be? Well, and we'll get into this in more detail in language. I think the, the focus in the Apostles' Creed was to really look at the person and activity of God and the struggle in the early church and really a struggle for us today is how do we, we will never fully understand, but how do we glimpse more fully this reality of three in one? And the following creeds, and we'll see that in February where we look at the brief statement, um, use the same structure. So you have the three parts, very different things that we will discover then get included under um, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So it, it was a formative organizing tool and has remained that to this day. Thank you, Roger. That's it, it is the piece of continuity, despite all the discontinuity in the creeds. Uh, Bill has a question. Yes, hi. Uh, I had a question. Why did the uh, Apostles' Creed supplant the Nicene Creed? The Nicene Creed uh, predated it and was in another one of these attempts to codify a, a uniform Statement right. of belief that was sort of imposed, you know, by a Roman Empire, I think, at one point. And all, why did that fall out of favor, and why was it replaced by the Apostles' Creed? Well, I and and it's, I think we'll see as we look. The Nicene is much more powerful in the Orthodox Church, in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I think, in my understanding, it's related to this 
split East and West of Christianity. And those who were staying with the Roman Empire gravitated to the Apostles' Creed. Those who were in the Orthodox churches found the Nicene Creed to be most formative. And so just in the process of thought, they separated out. Um, and it, there's much more we can learn and we ought to look at the Nicene Creed too. We won't try and do that this morning, but a good question. I guess that's it. Well, as I look at my watch, we better jump into the language. I knew it was going to be tight. And I assure you, we'll be going back and forth from brief statement and echoes of the Apostles' Creed in February. But that's a long ways off. Um, some of what I was just saying, we need to pick up on in the language of the creed. And it's Clearly, it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, our postmodern ears wrestle with that a bit in terms of language, but we have to remember that certainly at the time of Jesus and afterwards, patriarchy was taken for granted. Um, and Father was important for several reasons. First of all, it was the Father of Jesus Christ, arguing clearly that there was an intrinsic and organic relationship between Jesus and God. Um, Almighty came into play because there was a concern that the world didn't have separate spheres, the evil and the good, um, that Jack suggests, Jack Rogers suggests that this was, should have been sovereign, would have been a much better way to translate that. But we can't tell our spiritual ancestors what to do after the fact. But sovereign or almighty is God in power. Father becomes a sense of goodness as in the birth of a child, the bonding with the child, the image of the personal interaction. Um, and that was, that was Augustine's sense of why these two words, God the Father Almighty, and interestingly at the beginning, they did not have maker of heaven and earth. But there was a distinct challenge was God just there in the church and there in the believers' lives, apart from the broader world. And our early spiritual forebearers saw, no, this had to be connected to Genesis 1. And some of you are in Genesis with Lucy and Tom in that Bible study. There's always been a struggle. How do we know that the entirety of our world is under the sovereignty of God. So that phrase maker, or in some translations, it's creator of heaven and earth. Um, the key thing here was a continuing struggle with polytheism. Nothing else was to be deified. So that trees, not water, you know, wind is a symbol of the spirit, but it's, we don't, deify the wind. Um, and a reminder to me that was interesting is that Christianity has never been anti-world or anti-body. Um, it is an inherently good world that God created, as the Genesis account reminds us, but it has been distorted by sin, injustice, and violence. So that's part of, as we tease out the language at, at the beginning there, that's part of what's going on. I was also reminded of something that I learned from 
Peter Gomes, who was prior to Lucy, <laughs> chaplain at Harvard and uh, a theologian and author. Um, one phrase I will never forget, all translation is interpretation. And so there's nothing linear in translation. And we've, we've got to face that because we had Greek and Latin versions here, but when Charlemagne wanted everybody to be able to not only say it, but know it, suddenly there were French and German versions. Um, so that's gonna complicate our understanding of the language. Um, <clears throat> there are some quirky language things, and it's intriguing to me that in the Nicene Creed, they say the living and the dead. In the Apostles' Creed, we say the quick and the dead. Now, yes, synonyms, but if we're looking at language, it's intriguing why we have chosen. And uh, <clears throat> here is a good time to suggest that well-meaning attempts to update the Apostles' Creed have usually gone on the rocks. I might relate this to the experience that happened to me at the Lincoln Park Church about the same time as John Buchanan and the Fourth Church were struggling with, oh, gee, let's reword the Lord's Prayer. I tried that one Sunday working with a worship committee, and I have not spent so much pastoral time with irate parishioners on the phone. <laughs> as I did the following week. I think we've learned that we appreciate the language of the past. We hold to that. We explore it. That's why we need more contemporary language, which we'll get to in detail in the brief statement. Clearly, the focus for the Apostles' Creed, as well as Nicene, was on um, Jesus, his passion, death, and resurrection. Um, you have born of the Virgin Mary, and in my mind, the most significant comma in history. Born of the Virgin Mary, comma, suffered under Pontius Pilate. The entire life and ministry of Jesus is in that comma. And that's why we're going to look at the brief statement, because it goes into many of those details. In my reading, I found that there were efforts to include parts of Jesus' life and ministry, but they were never formally included in the creed. Um, it's also intriguing in these categories, because, and that's why the question answer works so well. Do you believe in God? And then you get God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And you get the qualifiers for Jesus and a summary of his passion. And then, you know, we come to the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Again, issues of translation. Um, all of the following categories are under the Holy Spirit, a powerful reminder that we come to God in our own discipleship through the presence of the Spirit in our own lives, in the life of the church, and in the life of the world. Um, so you've got the Holy Ghost. There is always the interesting phrase, the Holy Catholic Church. Now, if we're good English scholars, we understand the difference between Catholic lower C and Catholic capital C. But I had a woman come up to me after worship one Sunday and say, I thought I was in a Presbyterian church. Why do we affirm our belief in the Holy Catholic Church? It was, you know, we, we had a slight grammar lesson with good nature about universal versus a title of a church. Um, but I've had other people comment on that too. So if we're looking at the language, just needed to name that. Communion of saints is a very evocative phrase. 
um, our spiritual ancestors are with that. Think of times when we're at the we're communing at the Lord's table. Often we will affirm that we are in the presence of all believers before us, present now with us. Um, and so the communion of saints, and just a quick reminder again, this is saints in the Apostle Paul's frame. All God's people are saints. We are all saints. And so this is a very inclusive phrase that I think is very important. And then resurrection of the body. I've been in several day seminars on this, so we won't attempt to go very deep, but it's a reminder that Christianity um, overcame in our understanding a more Gnostic idea that you know, at death, our spirits depart, our bodies are different. We affirm that our whole selves are resurrected. We are new beings. And I find the best biblical help on this in terms of the uh, disciples encountering the risen Jesus. There was something very different, but there was something the same. And this gives us clues to a sense of why resurrection. And lastly, life everlasting. We pick this up now in more recent creeds as in life and in death, we belong to God. A sense of this continuity in our experience of God. Couple of quick questions and I'll shut up and hopefully we've got some time for you to comment. Um, I'm curious in your experience, I've had people say that saying the Apostles' Creed is one of the most sacred moments in worship. Some of these same people are very upset when we're saying something else. But I'm curious what for you is sacred in saying the Apostles' Creed. Um, I've got a good example there, but we're going to let that go because I want to get you all in on this conversation. Go ahead, Patsy. Okay. Actually, Bill has a question. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yes. in, in reading the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, there is reference in the Apostles' Creed, Christ died, was buried, and descended into hell. That and I missed that. That right. doesn't appear in the Nicene Creed, as far as I can tell, and it doesn't appeal, appear in some of the early versions of the Apostles' Creed. Is, I mean, what's the biblical support for him descending into hell? I think we've always struggled with <laughs> what happened on Holy Saturday, Bill. Um, but I was also intrigued, and credit Jack Rogers again. John Calvin saw in Jesus' descent into hell. First of all, we're dealing with a three-story universe, heaven above, earth, hell below, which fundamentally isn't what we affirm these days, but it was the cosmos as they knew it. Calvin says that in the phrase descending into hell, Jesus descended into the utter anguish that we human beings experience, the hellishness of our life. And that became a powerful sense of the rhythm. And before he could ascend, he needed to descend into this anguish. And then with a full understanding, and you've heard Shannon many times say this, God knows our human experience from the inside through Jesus, and therefore God knows us. Um, Calvin's experience, uh, expression helped me on this. Great question, though, because you're right. It's framed differently than the earliest sources and the Nicene. Thanks, Bill. Jeff, would you say that was more theological, kind of metaphorical theological? I mean, it's a statement of theology more than it's a kind of 
thing of Jesus was literally, I mean, yeah, it's metaphorical. I mean, would you say that? I'm just, yes. I'm, I've always fussed with that one too. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> well and the translations don't want us saying hell, you know, so we, we get cosmological definitions. Was this the land of the dead? I'm much more um, with Calvin here that this is metaf metaphorical and identifies with the hellishness, the anguish, the depths of our human agony that God has experienced and then can identify with. Thanks, Lucy. Roger, I saw the start. Why don't you speak it quickly if you're willing to? My, my Methodist upbringing, I don't believe the descendant into hell was included in the Apostles' Creed in the Methodist Church. It has been a variable precisely when we name hell as hell, which I hate to say it, rather than profound theological difference, that's probably what was there. Um, but this indicates that the evolution of the Apostles' Creed continues. We're still searching. Is that included? Okay. And what's the format as uh, we've raised already? So creeds don't stop talking. And thank you, though, for your witness on this. <clears throat> Yes, Marcia. You know, I have read a most intriguing book by John Dominic Crossan. Oh, yeah. I'm not pronouncing his name properly, perhaps. However, the title of the book is Resurrecting Easter, How the West Lost and the East Kept the Original Easter Vision. And what he did was to go into Eastern Christian um, communities and look at the artwork and most of those include Jesus bringing souls up out of hell as he was resurrected so I like that image as I listen as I speak this I descended into hell why to get the rest of us up there with him I think that's a great image and and great work and part of the reason <clears throat> that some of us are going to want to affirm to keep descended into hell. It is metaphorical. It also helps to connect. What about all those people who died before Jesus? Uh, <laughs> there is a sense that it's, this is an eternal affirmation and people aren't excluded because of when they came into being chronologically. Great affirmation, Marcia. Thank you. And credit to Crossing. Yes. I remember seeing a, I think it was a sarcophagus in, in a church in Florence that had scenes of Easter, but it had this really big bas relief of Jesus just knocking everything down when he went down to hell. He kicked, kicked the gate, the, uh, <laughs> the doors down the uh, pediment above the door, and it was just chaos. So it was a really satisfying picture. That is splendid. And because it was carved in, in, in bronze uh, in the side. Ooh. I think it was a sarcophagus up on a, on a platform oh. in the church. Oh, excellent. If we're well, gonna- It wasn't a little picture, a big picture. Yeah. A big part of the, of the story. And that- underlines the sovereignty of God is not just our time and place, it is over eternity that we affirm God is sovereign in the early words of the creed. So this connects back to that. What a powerful image, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> we are crunching in on closing time, I see here, but I want to get other questions. We'll have another two weeks on that if you're patient and available. 
in February. So we'll keep some dialogue between the Apostles' Creed and the brief statement. I think that's that's a real learning place. We seldom, you know, we affirm a creed, but we don't talk enough about them, I'm convinced, or compare. So don't hesitate now. We'll keep those no. questions coming. Louise? Uh, Louise. This, maybe this is a few months too early to say, but you know, Jack Stotts was at Fourth Church when they did the brief statement, and we got input on the first draft. Indeed. And Cynthia Campbell was also, I think, involved at that time, and they were in Chicago at that time. Yeah. For me, the brief statement is fascinating because I was involved with a group who helped shape the language. Jack uh, was a dear friend, and so I was so grateful when I learned that he and Jane Dempsey Douglas from Princeton were the ones heading this effort. Great reminder, Louise, that gets you a little personal taste of what we'll deal with in February. Do, do we know, Jeff, when it was included in services, roughly, or was it a geographic question, or was it a in, can we pinpoint any time and time and place when services became more standard? And so we had to say this statement in, in group in church? Oh, it was put into the Book of Order as one that could be you. You know, there's two parts to the Book of Order. It was in the Book of your Order, and some churches chose to use it, and some chose to stay with whatever they were using at the time. This is my understanding. Are you asking historically, though, Jim, as in that that a well, the, the idea that you this was not just for the newly baptized, but it was everyone reaffirming it when they gathered for services. I okay, think I started I started back in the in the eighth into ninth centuries because it was part of Charlemagne's concern for uniformity. And you get that by teaching, but I think it also then became part of the litur liturgy. It's a very good question, though. I need to do some more work on that. <laughs> Any other quick questions or? Jeff, you might have covered this before I got on. I'm really sorry I was late. I ended up. Uh making the strategic de decision to go out and greet people after worship. <laughs> so, That's um, very important. And then tear home, you know. But um, did you talk about traditions that don't use creeds? I don't know if you did, but I know I grew up Baptist and we never had creeds. We didn't believe in creeds. <laughs> so, you know, it, maybe that- It was in my notes and I took a look at the clock and didn't, but- Okay, I well, it's not a big deal. I just think it was interesting when Roger was talking about the Methodist church and how, you know, maybe the language of one of the creeds was different than the Presbyterian and, you know, on it goes. And it's probably a side, po a side point. So I don't think we need to spend much time on that, but I was just curious. Oh, it's, I, and I didn't and had planned to. I mean, we have, it's not simply the Reformed tradition that's creedal. Our siblings in the United Church of Christ, which is a key denomination within the Reformed tradition, do not honor creeds. They use them sporadically. And then we have to say confessionally, many Presbyterian churches no longer include creeds in their worship. When I visit, it's hello. <laughs> so it's, it's not only others, but us. And certainly Baptists are non-creedal. The Congregationalists now, United Church of Christ would agree on that, although they occasionally use them. So <clears throat> I like it because it means that not only is worship the work of the people, theology is also the work of the people, framing what we believe, and then we need to do it together. So I couldn't agree more. Thank you. That's why I became a Presbyterian. One of the reasons, but no, really, seriously, that's a beautiful, thank you for that statement. And I think it is also the catechesis, I mean, that we're teaching. There is a teaching function within 
our worshiping community that every time we say that we go back to the, the question. So thank you yep. again, sorry. Good. Anything else fast or shall I pray us out? Jim, do you need any last words? Um, no, I will just say uh, thank you all for attending and for our changes in schedule and venue, et cetera. Please keep an eye on your emails and our webpage. We're trying our best to keep up with all the uh, ways we have to change. I hope it settles down soon and it should. So just keep an eye out for all the opportunities that we have going. Jim, um, next week, I know it was announced in worship, uh, but about the um, Dozman uh, Buchanan class, that that will be in person on site and it will be recorded so that those that are unable to attend can watch it. And it sounds like it will be in uh, the Borwell dining room to be able to provide uh, some Good. distance within um, the group. So anyway, just wanted to, to let people know that. Great. Let's have a concluding word of prayer. Thank you, God, for this time together. Thank you that you have granted us minds to employ in our faith as well as hearts and souls, thought and action. We give heartfelt thanks for the Apostles' Creed and all the creeds that have informed and shaped our journey as your people. May we hear echoes of discussion as we stand to affirm the Apostles' Creed the next time we do in worship. All this we pray through your wondrous sovereign name and in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Man. Thank you so much, folks. Thanks, Thank Jeff. Thank Jeff. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye, yeah. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.